all, we just witnessed something very important. Uh, we just witnessed, witnessed a, a baptism, and uh, it's um, a way of becoming part of, <clears throat> part of Christ's uh, body, which is the church. And so um, it's a day that, uh, it's kind of like a birthday, a day to remember when you make that commitment that <clears throat> accepted Christ. <clears throat> As you can hear, I'm still suffering from last week's, uh, this thing has lasted over a week, but I'm a lot better than it was last week, and I've taken the COVID test, so I'm clear. <laughs> so you can get close to me, all right? <laughs> all right, so um, what we're going to do this morning, we will consider um, some very important questions, very important questions in regards to um, what does it mean? Or what happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And there are three very simple questions, but they are profound, okay? The first question is, what happens? What takes place? Second question is, how? How does this happen? How does it take place? <clears throat> what happens? Third question is, when? In other words, simply put, the questions are, what happens? How does it happen? When does it happen? So what, that's what we're going to look at this morning. And so let's look at the first one. What happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And for that, we go to the Old Testament. We go to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, verses 26 and 27. Listen carefully to these words of the prophet. I will give you a new heart. A new what? A new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you will keep my judgments <clears throat> and do them. So what happens? We receive a new heart. In other words, a new mind, a new way of thinking. A new way. He takes out the heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh. This is what the prophet Ezekiel tells us. So it's what we know as being born again, right? And uh, it's a heart transplant. I was reading about um, a young man by the name of Felipe Garza. Felipe Garza from Patterson City, Patterson. This young man was born with a defect. Well, he used to go through headaches. And I'm talking about bad ones, migraine, uh, I mean, uh, migraine headaches. And, um, you know, they were so bad. But, you know, this young man, Felipe Garza, this young man, he wasn't a complainer. So his parents didn't take it that seriously. But they were bad. Now, his girlfriend, Donna Ashlock. Donna Ashlock, now these were teenagers, teenagers, by the way. They were, I think, a sophomore in high school. His girlfriend, Donna Ashlock, she had a more serious problem. She was born with a heart defect. She was born with a heart defect. Um, and her days were numbered when she was in high school. And Felipe, one day, <clears throat> around the dinner table, he said to his parents, if anything should ever happen to me. Now, he knew how bad those headaches were, but his parents didn't because he wasn't a complainer. He didn't make no fuss. And so what happened, he said to them, he said to them, if something should ever happen to me, you want me to go on this? The microphone is away from the pastor. Okay. This way? Up here, okay. Right about there? Okay. Let's try this. Got it? Why don't you give me a mic? <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm going to take the mic. Okay. <laughs> my ears are too big.
Now, where was I in this story? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Is it on? Is, is this work? Yeah, I know, I know. Yes, um, so over the dinner table, what happened was one day Felipe uh, Garza says to his parents, <coughs> if anything should happen to me, I want to donate. I want to give my heart to, to Donna. Well, they thought it was a joke. They didn't think he was serious. Time went on, and um, he had one of these terrible headaches, these migraines, a bad one. And the parents found him unconscious. And so they called paramedics, and they took him. They took him to the nearest hospital. And they tried to do CPR on him. They tried to revive him. They tried all kind of ways to bring him back to life. And Felipe died in the emergency room. The parents were devastated. And through their tears, through their pain, through their sorrow, they remembered Felipe wanted to donate his heart to Donna. And so they called the uh, Ashlock family. They called them and let them know that he wanted to give his heart to Donna. Well, they had to rush right away. They, the parents and Donna rushed to the hospital. And you know, they had to go through a battery of tests, lab work for com compatibility. And unbelievable, it was a match. And she went straight into the operating room. It was a five-hour operation. And it was a success. When she came out of that, um, came to, that is, came to in the uh, recovery room, the first thing she said, I can breathe. And through this transplant, this heart transplant, it increased her lifespan. She was able to do things she couldn't do before. What happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? There's a change that takes place. In other words, the Holy Spirit begins to operate in the life like the prophet Ezekiel says. Changes began. Now, let's go to the next step. We said that was what happens, a new heart, a new mind. How does it happen? The, the, we read in Ezekiel, we read in Ezekiel, I will put my spirit within you. I will put my spirit within you. The Holy Spirit is what brings a, a, about this lovely change in our life. It's not something that we can do. The Bible says we're born with a heart of stone, a fallen nature, sinful nature, we need this transplant. We need the Holy Spirit. No other way. We can't do it. We can't change ourselves. <clears throat> One of the Old Testament prophets says, you know, can the Ethiopian change his skin color or the leopard his spots? No. Neither can you. Unless it's through the Holy Spirit. That change that takes place. So how does it happen? Through the Holy Spirit. Now the third question, what was it? When? <clears throat> when does this new birth, when does this take place? The Bible says in <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 38, then Peter said to them, this is when 3,000 were converted in one day, in the day of Pentecost. Peter said to them, Repent, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says repentance. And baptism, repentance, I'm going to say a little bit more about it, but when we're baptized, it's a washing away of our sins, our past sins. And it's a uh, forgiveness of sins. According to this promise, 
God will forgive the darkest sins. In Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet says this, Isaiah 1.8, come now, let us reason together. He says, let us reason together. And he says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isn't that beautiful? Though they are red like grimson, grimson is red, they shall be as wool. In other words, I don't care what you've done. What any of us have done, when we receive Christ who died for our sins, our sins are blotted out. They're washed away. Now, repentance is the work of the Holy Spirit. I used to think that it was my job to repent, you know, to look for it. The Holy Spirit is the one that leads us to repentance. It brings conviction to our souls, working on the conscience. Hey, that's wrong, what you're doing. What you're doing is not good. You know the commandments of God. You know that that's wrong. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings about conviction, not you or me. We're not the, one, we're not the Holy Spirit. We're not the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. And, uh, and, there's, uh, and then also, baptism, which you just witnessed, uh, Jessica being baptized, it's a, it's a new beginning. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect or no one's perfect after baptism. But it's a new beginning. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, or do you not know? that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. You just saw that up there. Did you not? You're baptized into his death. <clears throat> Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Dying to the old self. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in in newness of life. We start thinking a little differently. we more loving, more caring. We care for our parents. We care for our wives and husbands. A change takes place in us. We want the best for the home. We want the best for everyone. So, you know, I, I like to say this. Baptism is the beginning of the Christian experience, not the end. We prepare for it, and we have Bible studies. We, we, need, to, we need to make an intelligent decision, but it's the beginning, not the end. It's like a marriage. When you first get married, I remember when I first got married with my wife, I, I knew very little. I thought I knew a lot. I thought I knew her quite well. <laughs> it, wasn't, it was just the beginning of a life together. You get to know each other. You get to learn about each other. And so it's the beginning. It's the same with a Christian life. Baptism is the beginning, not the end. We know the basics. We know the fundamentals. Through baptism, what it is, we're giving witness of our, our accepting Jesus Christ. And it's how we become members of the body of Christ. In other words, the church. <clears throat> we become members of his body. So what happens next? Okay, what? We receive the new heart, a new mind. How? Through the Holy Spirit. When? When we repent and are baptized, we're forgiven, our, our sins are washed away. What happens next? We do that what? What are they? What, how, and when? What happens next? We start to develop a new character, a new way of life, a new character, and... Um, how do these changes take place, though? Do we have to go and... No, it's also by faith, the way the new heart was by faith. This is by faith. Ezekiel 36, 27. This is the second part of the verse. <clears throat> and this is on growing. How do we grow? How do we become more Christ-like, more loving, more caring? You know, God puts a big, big premium on how we treat people. When you become, the character should start changing. How you treat your spouse, how you treat your kids, 
how you treat people. Character development. It says this, I will put my spirit within you and cause you. What does it say? I will cause you to walk in my statues and keep my judgments and do them. In other words, it's not something we can do. We need the power of the Holy Spirit because there's Satan. He, he's trying to keep us away from God. So the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us, empowers us, gives us the strength to live a Christian life. Not something that we can do. Now, here comes a clincher. When do we receive a new character, a loving character, Christ-like character? Um, now, is it instantly? Once we uh, take this step? No. We're told it's the work of a lifetime. It's a growing process. We see it in the Bible characters through the Old and New Testament. They were growing in their relationship with God. It's, it doesn't happen overnight. And how does it happen, though? We'll go to the next question. Okay, so we know how. It's through the Holy Spirit. We're told that the Holy Spirit begins to adorn our lives or enrich our lives through the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. These, these, are, these are the ones for character development. So how do we de develop this character? By abiding in Christ, abiding in God. It's not something, you know, people ask, hey, What's our part in this? Christ died for our sins. He paid the full price. He met the standard through his perfect life. We're clothed with his robe of righteousness. God doesn't see us. He sees Christ in our place. How does this happen? We abide in Christ by faith, prayer. That relationship with God through prayer. And you say, oh, that's easy. The devil will do everything in his power to keep you from your knees from going down and praying. And not only that, believing that prayers work. Believing that God will answer your prayers. Yes. And through the reading of God's word. And something that we need to do is service. We heard a little bit here about service to the homeless. We need to serve. Now, let's read it. Ephesians 6, 18 for pray. Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance. You see, you need perseverance because very few, there's very little prayer. People say, oh, prayer don't work, you know. No, it does, but it has to be with faith. You need to believe. You need to trust. It says, with perseverance and supplication for all the saints, in other words, the members, so prayer and the word of God, it says, Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation. This is the armor of God and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We need to not just read it. We need to meditate on the word. Take time, not just a quick reading. You know, I got to get to work and make some time for your relationship with God, abiding with God. He will do everything, I'm talking about the enemy, to keep you from the word, because the word is where the power is. It's there in the word. And in order to develop a Christ-like character, we need to trust in his guidance. God is guiding you. Every one of us here has been guided this far. It, it, <clears throat> the wise man, the wisest man to live on earth, King Solomon, the son of King David, says these words on trust. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Yes. So this is where some people get discouraged. You know, I, I've talked to people and they told me, you know, I thought when when I accepted Jesus Christ, when I accepted my, accepted God, 
I thought it was going to change overnight. Doesn't happen. You know, I want to tell you a story, <coughs> a true story. There was a young man in San Diego by the name of uh, Bob Bennett. Bob Bennett, you know, he used to, um, he was in sports, but he got into marijuana. He got into marijuana, and um, then he went into heroin. He got into heroin. He was a heroin addict. Crossing the border, crossing the border, he got caught. He was sent to Chino Prison. He was in Chino Prison for three years. And he came out. He don't know how it happened, but he ended up in, a, in San Bernardino in a Bible fellowship group. And in that Bible fellowship group, there was a young lady by the name of Helen who was leading out in the Bible study. And he said this, that was the first time that I understood the gospel. The first time that I understood the gospel, that Jesus Christ had died for my many sins, had paid the full price. And so he tried to leave the heroin. And he was with a young lady, and he got so high, he was so high, that she called the police, and he was sent to Texas to another prison. It was one failure after another trying to change. Heroin is very difficult. It's both physical and mental. So he, he was sent to a prison in Texas where they had a, um, with these uh, rehabilitation um, uh, centers. So, but the group, that the young people in San Bernardino, Helen and her group, they kept praying for Bob. They kept praying for him. And the poor guy, when he came back out, he said he wanted to change his life. And so he decided, and they talked to him, his friends, and why don't you go to college? So he enrolled at La Sierra University. He went to school there. And I, will, I must have been about 18, 19 years old. I'd go to church, you know. My mother was a Christian, and my father wasn't. And I'd go to church, you know, but I never, my mom says, there's going to be a testimony. You need to go listen to this young man that changed his life. And so I went. And that's the first time I met Bob. And he was giving his testimony. And I remember as a young man, when he rolled up his sleeves and showed the track marks, you know, on his arms, heroin addict. And, and talking about the change, talking about Jesus, Jesus being his friend. And I remember as a young man looking at this fella and saying, does Jesus have that kind of friends? I said, wow. Anyway. By the end of that testimony, lots of young people went forward. At that time, I wasn't one of them, but it did touch me. And so what happened was this. He completed his studies at La Sierra University, and he became a pastor. He pastored in my area. I'm from the Bay Area, San Jose. He was pastoring the Palo Alto Church. And um, he, he retired some time ago. He's, he's, he must have been in ministry for 40 years or more. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, the young lady that was giving the Bible study, Helen, they married. <laughs> they got together, and it was a big help for him because he had a lot of struggles. But, you know, God can make a change. But we can't do it on our own. It says, if you're trying to do it on your own, you're trying the impossible. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to take time. And you know what? It's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of time to wait on the Holy Spirit, wait on God. You know, we live in a very rushed society. We want to do this. We want to do that. I've learned. I've learned to myself that I need to wait for the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that you need to wait. You need to wait on the Lord, it says. And so, yeah, Bob, you know, it was, 
it was really amazing what happened to him. So the growth is what? It's slow. I, I mean, it's gradual. There's a beautiful quote. Um, I found this in Christ Object Lessons, page 6566. <clears throat> I think it says the truth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth, as its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous. You get that? But continuous. So is the development of Christian, the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet, if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual what? Advancement, continual growth. Sanctification is a work, what did we say? Of a lifetime. Don't give up. I know some right here today are struggling. It might be an addiction, a habit that you can't break. Don't give up. Don't give up. You're not alone. You know, I love this promise. I love this one of my favorite promises. Isaiah, the prophet, said this in verse 10. Fear not. And you could put your name here. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. In other words, don't be discouraged. For I will strengthen you. I will help you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a lovely promise, right? You are not alone. There's someone here this morning. There's someone here that is struggling, that is having a hard time. I want to let you know, don't give up. Don't give up. God is going to help you. And we're, it says we're all in different stages of development. We can expect a young person to be where I am or somebody else that's been, been a Christian for so many years. We've got to give them some slack. We've got to pray for them. So we need to remember that it's a work of a lifetime. Yes. So we talked about the Holy Spirit giving us a new heart. The Holy Spirit helping us develop a new character when we repent and are baptized. These are beautiful promises that God will be with us. If you haven't turned your life to Christ through baptism, think about it. You know, I'll give you a challenge. You're not going to be perfect like it says here. You're going to be growing like the experience that Bob Bennett had. But you have somebody that died for your sins, somebody that paid the full price and resurrected. He rested. He died on Friday before sunset, before Sabbath. When they went to check, when they went to check on the other two prisoners, they were well alive because the crucifixion was a long death. They were going to break his legs and bring him down because he was not going to stay up there on the Sabbath. The other two, they did that too. But the Bible said, the Messianic prophecies, prophecies said, no bone of his body will be broken. He rested on the tomb during the Sabbath day. And it says, according to the commandment. What commandment? The fourth commandment. And he resurrected on the first day of the week. Jesus Christ did everything he could for you and me. He lived a perfect life. And I know that during his daytime, during his time, everybody was expecting a different type of Messiah. They were expecting a David. They were expecting. But if you read the Old Testament Messianic prophecies, he fulfilled every single one. He fulfilled them. And so my challenge is this, is this that um, you think seriously. I know some here are thinking about baptism. Don't put it off. Get a hold of us. And, you know, we'll be more than happy to baptize you. So, you know, God is a good God, isn't he?